Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Um, it's, it's great, I always say this, to see you out and about and here in large numbers. Um, and it, and <clears throat> this thing's so far away from me. No, it's, all I want to say is that I, it's great to see you all. Welcome. Um, the, the, the numbers that you, you're out and here in uh, suggests that we have a very distinguished speaker today, which is the case. So if you um, oblige me, uh, I'm going to introduce him in Arabic first, and then I will introduce him in English, because we have a, a mixed uh, uh, audience this evening, which is great to see. Um, can you still hear me? Okay, because otherwise my boss will really lay into me afterwards. فسيداتي سادتي مرحبا يسرنا أن نراكم بحضوركم اليوم معنا ونتمنى أن نراكم على دوام في المستقبل في محاضرات المعهد معهد جامعة نيويورك أبو دبي سوف أقدم الضيف الكريم وأعطي سيرة قصيرة لعبد الخالق عبد الله عبد الله الخالق عبد الخالق عبد الله عفوا مواطن اماراتي من مواليد عام 1953 وهو استاذ متقاعد في العلوم السياسيه من جامعه الامارات ورئيس المجلس وحاليا رئيس المجلس العربي للعلوم الاجتماعيه شغل منصب مدير وحده ابحاث الخليج في الشرق على مدى 10 سنوات وهو حاصل على درجه الدكتوراه في العلوم السياسية من جامعة جورج تاون بواشنطن من دواحي واشنطن بالتحديد وشهادة الماجستير من جامعة الأمريكية في العاصمة واشنطن بذاتها كما حصل دكتور عبد الخالق على منحة فولبرايت وعمل أستاذا زائرا في مركز الدراسات العربية المعاصرة بجامعة جورج تاون كما أنه يدرس من حين لآخر مادة لطلاب الماجستير في برنامج دراسات الخليج في جامعة قطر تشمل اهتمامات دكتور البحثية قضايا التغيرات السياسية في الخليج والعالم العربي بصفة عامة وهو مؤلف العديد من الكتب بما في ذلك نظام الإقليمي في منطقة الخليج اعترافات أكاديمي متقاعد صدر في عام 2014 وفي عام 2015 صدر له كتاب آخر من نوع مختلف إماراتي في النيبول أتمنى أن أكون نطقت هذا بخير جيد ف... وقد نشر له أكثر من 50 مقالة وآخرها أذكر من آخرها آه، ثلاث عناوين تضاعيات الربيع العربي الدول المجلس التعاون الخليج الخليجي وقضايا الاجتماع السياسي ولحظة الخليج العربي وأخيرا آه، دول مجلس التعاون الخليجي على مفترق الطرق. So ladies and gentlemen, uh, عبد الخالق عبد الله, a distinguished guest, is a UA national born in 1953. He holds an MA, a magister. From the American University in Washington, D.C., and a PhD in political science from Georgetown University on the outskirts of Washington. Professor Abdullah was a Fulbright scholar and a visiting professor at the Center for Contemporary Arab Studies at Georgetown University. He is a retired professor now of political science. He's, um, he taught at the UAE University for many years, uh, but is currently chairman of the Arab Council for Social Science. He has served as director of the Gulf Research Unit at Sharjah for 10 years. He occasionally teaches a course for the Masters in Gulf Studies uh, program at Qatar University. His research, um, as you all know, I'm quite certain, uh, focus on, it focuses on, for the most part, issues of political change in the Gulf. And so, of course, his opinions are very sought after in this time of, of, of changes and the Arab world in general. He is the author of several books, including The Gulf Regional System, Confessions of a Retired Academic, uh, which was published in 2014 in Arabic. I don't, it's not in English yet, I think. And uh, a more um, 
let's say, eccentric book, but a more personal book, Last Emirati in Nepal, which was published in 2015 about his experience there after the earthquake. He has published more than 50 articles, and the latest are the following titles, The Repercussions of the Arab Spring for the GCC States, uh, another title, Socio-Political Issues of the Arab Gulf Moment, and finally, GCC at a, the GCC at a Crossroads. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, please join me in warmly welcoming Dr. Khaled Abdullah. Shukran, uh, Philip, Professor Kennedy. Thank you very much for this kind of introduction. One thing is uh, for sure, I'm not as retired as I confess to be. I'm still very active. I do not teach uh, at Emirates University after 33 years of teaching, but I am fully committed to academia, writings, readings, traveling, giving lectures like this. So I'm, I wrote that book and I regret writing it. Okay. And uh, that last Emirati in Nepal also came out of a very tragic experience of mine. I am also an adventurist of a sort. I go to summits here and there, Kalimanjaro, Al Alp, Fuji Mountain, and my last attempt to reach Everest, Everest Base Camp, that is, around 6,000 elevator, 6,000 meters uh, uh, above sea level. And in the fifth day, uh, there was the earthquake uh, last year. 9,000 people died in Nepal as a result, and I was at 3,600 meters in a city called Namshi, and we just caught there for three very difficult uh, nights. And uh, as a result, uh, I wrote this book called The Last Emirati in Nepal because there were nine of us and eight of them were, you know, managed to go out in the first 24 hours and I was the last one there. So it was one of those experiences that I had to go through. I'd like first to thank New York University of Abu Dhabi for inviting me and for organizing this event. And uh, I also like uh, to thank uh, each one of you in this uh, lecture hall here for coming. And I hope uh, you, know, you uh, lower your expectation as much as you can. So I hope I could live up to your expectation and I hope it is uh, worthwhile your time. But I'd like to thank in particular, the wonderful and the gorgeous Nahad at the background who put all this together, her and her team, deserve the best of, uh, best of uh, thank and shukran Nahad for uh, putting this uh, evening together. This is my uh, fourth year visiting NYU Abu Dhabi. This is not the first. Twice at the old campus downtown uh, and... Uh, this is my second year in this beautiful state-of-the-art uh, campus here in Saadiyat. Saadiyat is, is where the future of Abu Dhabi probably is. This island is going to be the future of the culture, the creativity, the tourism, and... Uh, and uh, education. So if you're looking for the future and in the future, you are right in here where it is being made on almost a daily basis. So we are very happy that uh, NYU is at Saadiyat and we are in Saadiyat Island. Something to look up to 10 years down the road, you will see it entirely a different place in here. And that's the topic for this evening. The topic is understanding the 21st century, understanding the Arab Gulf state of the 21st century, the UAE and the Qatar and the Bahrain and the Saudi Arabia and the Oman of uh, the 21st century. How do we understand the Arab Gulf states uh, of uh, the 21st century? There's two related topics. The title has two components. To it. And let me just very briefly try to clear these two components before I move into and dive into the real topic of the uh, lecture. The first component, of course, the Arab Gulf states. And by the Arab Gulf states, I have in mind these six 
countries, starting with Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, Bahrain, Qatar, all the way down to United Arab Emirates and Oman. These six countries have bunched together, have come together, and uh, they have managed over the past 33 years of GCC, of Gulf Cooperation Council, to have a regional identity of a sort. The outside world, when they look to this region, they see six nearly identical, nearly identical in their main socio-political, socio-economic, cultural, historical. They have so much in common. Actually, they have three things in common very briefly. They have this geographic proximity. They all belong to this region. Second, they have this culture affinity, historical, cultural affinity, which is very important ingredient for regional integration. And third, there is something called the geopolitical necessity, the security uh, uh, environment, neighborhood that we live in. When you have these three ingredients, cultural uh, affinity, geographic proximity, and geopolitical necessity, countries tend to come together and form integration and form regional integration, that is, and uh, which leads you eventually to a, a union of a sort like Europe. So the Arab Gulf states that I have in mind is the six GCC countries that have acquired something called a Khaliji identity, a brand called Khaliji brand. Everybody here in this land called themselves Khaliji, eventually that identity becomes as important as the national Emirati, Kuwaiti, Qatari identity. But that's the, these are the group of countries that I have in mind, the Arab Gulf states. And the second component to this lecture tonight is, of course, the 21st century. And just a brief word about what do I have in mind when I say uh, the 21st century. And let me remind you that you know, the future is not something out there. The future is not where we're going to. The future is what we make right now and here. You make future. You don't go to the future. And as a result, in many ways, you know, as much as we live the present, we also make our future. And of all the countries in the region, the 22 Arab countries for sure, and all, of all the countries in the region, no... The, there isn't any other country that is really making the future as the UAE and as the six GCC countries. They are really not going into the future. They are, at the moment, making the future. And the UAE is leading that kind of uh, endeavor to, uh, uh, and thinking along that line, that future is not something you go to the future is something that you make and you make right now, and the future is here, it's not tomorrow. The future is today rather than tomorrow. So with that two introduction in mind, uh, the Arab Gulf state and the 21st century, uh, I feel like uh, I have at least three big categories that I like to bring to your attention and introduce uh, them to you, at least four of them. Uh, the first is that I will try to introduce what do I mean by the Arab Gulf states of the 21st century. So that's topic number one. And the topic number two, I will focus on something called the UAE momentum, between brackets, the UAE momentum in this Arab Gulf states of the 20th first century. I see something very interesting happening in here, and I call it a UAE momentum in this, uh, uh, at this moment in history. And the second uh, concept that I like to bring to your attention is called the Gulf moment. There is the UAE momentum, and then there is the Gulf moment. And I strongly believe that there is something called the Gulf moment in contemporary Arab history. So that's the second concept that I will try to bring uh, to your uh, attention. And the third, you know, if we have time, uh, uh, I'd like to briefly touch on at least one or two really central challenges 
central challenges that the Arab Gulf states of the 21st century are facing. And I will limit myself to, two, to one or two because of the time. And I hopefully, you know, during the Q&A session and the comment session, maybe you would like me to uh, probably go into uh, to some other challenges. So let me first then introduce the Arab Gulf states of the 21st century. Uh, there is plenty of evidence. So there is plenty of tangible evidence, concrete evidence, physical evidence, to uh, show that uh, the Arab Gulf states of the past 15 years, if they, you know, since 2000 onward, are vastly different, vastly, greatly, hugely different from the Arab Gulf states of say, 40 years ago, or the second half of the 20th century. A lot of evidence. You could go through it all, and we might probably go through some of it. These states, I think, have gone through some profound changes. Unbelievable. Have been on a fast track of changes after changes, fast changing societies, economies, uh, states, uh, that... Uh, have taken them to places that they would probably have never imagined that they would be in just 40, 50 years ago. In a way, these countries, more so than any other country that I would probably, that comes to my mind at least, they have been fast changing, fast modernizing, fast globalizing, all in one pack, all in one package all in one process, fast changing, fast modernizing, and fast even globalizing, to catch up with globality, with modernity, with 20th century, 21st century. If I take the past 50, 60 years of our history, of the Arab Gulf states' recent history, since 50s or 60s, 70s onwards. These states have gone at least three, two, three distinct phases in their evolution. Not one, two, but three, literally. Anything that is pre-1970, everything that was there before 1970, before 1971, 1970 basically, I call the pre-modern phase, the more traditional, close, simple, uh, conservative, one-dimensional, very modest in their resources. That was the case. And of course, uh, uh, British or Britain was in total control, not independent state. So there is this phase, which is the traditional, the pre-modern phase, which is anything I would you know, the, the pre-1970. That's the pre-modernity phase in the Arab Gulf states, in the recent Arab Gulf states history. The 1971, all the way up to 2000, more or less, this is the second phase of our evolution, and I call it the first modernity. Huge investment in the infrastructure, in the education, in building a brand new society, literally. So the period from 1970, 2000, I label it under, under this category called the first modernity phase. Huge changes taking place during this period, basically dealing with the challenges of independence, building a new state, an independent state, dealing with the oil boom, building the infrastructure, trying to catch up with modernity. And this phase has literally, more or less, have ended with the building of a new economy, a new society, a new 
states of arts and infrastructure and everything else, some more, some less, but in general, the phase of modernity have basically come to the first phase of uh, modernity came more or less to an end by 2000. 2000 onward, the last 15 years and continuing, I call this period as the second modernity. The thing, the investment in the superstructure, not just the infrastructure, the culture, the education, all the other service sectors in the, in the, in the social, in the values, there's, there is this reminiscence of what happened during the 70s that is happening once again, that has happened once again during the last 10, 15 years. All of this is in preparation for the Arab Gulf states of the 21st century, for the next 30, 40 years to come. There is a huge emphasis on building now not the first modernity, but the second modernity phase in our history. And, uh, you know, since 2000, up until now, and the movement is continuing, everything that you see is indeed in preparation for the title of this lecture, the Arab Gulf States of the 21st century. And the big question is, how do we understand this phase? What is the best way to describe it? Is there one concept or concepts that help us understand, describe what these six Arab Gulf states are going through? the changes, the investment, the outlooks, the programs, the policies. Uh, let me bring to your attention the fact that there is a lot of scholarly work going on, trying to grasp, trying to understand the magnitude of change that is taking place these days. And there isn't just one concept. I have come across a few of them. And I will try just to maybe alert you to three such concepts and see whether they really make sense. They give you a better understanding of this uh, phase in our history. I have heard some refer to this Arab Gulf states of the 21st century as the new Gulf. There is this concept, there's a whole book. And articles that talk about the new Gulf, whatever that means. Okay. But there is this concept that describes the vast changes that has taken place over the past 15 years and before as ending up or leading to or creating something called the new Gulf, a brand new Gulf that was not there before. A Gulf that is probably you know, totally different from the Gulf of the 20th century. <clears throat> and, uh, you know, uh, they take uh, economic indicators, uh, social indicators, and human development indicators to prove that, you know, there is something called a new gulf, as opposed to an old gulf of a sort. And uh, if you want a, a good book on this, uh, there is a, a book uh, by... Uh, Edmund Sullivan called, the title of that book is exactly that, The New Gulf, How the Modern Arabia is Changing the World. Very, you know, uh, very ambitious uh, title in there, but that's a kind of concept, The New Gulf. That's one attempt at understanding the Arab Gulf states of the 20th century as being a new gulf. A second concept that I've been hearing, and I... Uh, uh, you know, it's in the literature if you want to go. And uh, this is the concept of the post rentier state Arab Gulf. Post or late rentierism. And late rentierism came along uh, 
uh, in the literature trying to describe the Arab Gulf states from a very political economy perspective. Namely that you know, the Arab Gulf states of the first phase of modernity was basically an oil-based, basically an a rentier state. That the economy would not function without oil revenues. The late rentierism or the post-rentier concept comes to say, well, there is something new has happened, Gulf watchers, and the new thing is that maybe these countries are not as dependent today in the 21st century on oil as they used to be 40, 50 years ago. And this has a massive implication for understanding the Gulf because we, all scholars of the Gulf, whenever they looked at the Gulf in the past 40, 50 years, they looked at it from one prism, which is a rentier state. But the vast changes that has taken place made that paradigm problematic and questionable. So people no longer view the Arab Gulf states as rentier states. There is a few changes in there, and the Arab Gulf states are <coughs> diversifying their economy, uh, going into uh, different uh, uh, sectors uh, that are developing, and uh, look at uh, Dubai, and look at Qatar, and look at Bahrain, and look at you know, the UAE and Oman. They no longer probably uh, fit that classic rentierism uh, uh, model. Uh, a third category, a third concept that I have come across, and it is, it is in the literature, and you could uh, you know, check the literature, uh, beside the new Gulf, the post-rentierism, there is this concept that focuses on the, the, the global versus the local. And that the Arab Gulf states have traveled quite a bit in, on the global ladder to the point where you would see so much visibility of the globe in their life, in every corner of the society, wherever you look today, there is signs of the globe living side by side next to the local, to the point where in some places the global is more visible than the local. Classic example probably is Dubai and Abu Dhabi and Doha and the global cities, but that's not it. Global companies, uh, uh, global uh, investors, uh, 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 the, the, the demographic composition of these uh, societies, the global uh, outreach, the network of friends and network of, uh, of, of, of companies uh, that are, that are Gulf-based, yet they have uh, global investment all over the place. So the global Gulf is another way of looking at the Arab Gulf states of the 21st century too. These are one, two, three different concepts, but they are not mere concepts, by the way. They are not just theoretical concepts and terms that are floating around. They convey something very important. They convey the following. They convey at least six, five, whatever features that are important to that that have that are important to recognize and hence to understand how these Arab Gulf states of the 21st century are probably different than the Arab Gulf states of the 20th century. First, the economic economically, there is this definite attempt, and in some places success, to break away from oil. So there is the post-rentierism that probably gives you some clue. The Arab Gulf states of the heavily dependent on oil 
is something of the past in some places. UAE for sure is one. Our dependence on oil has dropped to 30 and probably even less. So economically, oil is no longer in some places, Bahrain for sure, UAE for sure, and you know, other places too, is not as, as a key driver as it used to be 40 years ago. Second, socially, the Arab Gulf states is also not as traditional, as conservative, as close, as Bedouin, as one-dimensional, whatever, as they used to be either. Today, the societies are much more diversified, much more diversified than they used to be 30 years ago. Thirdly, technologically, a state of the art in many places, ITs and technology applications and uh, you know, uh, usage is, is, is unmatched throughout the region. In many of these countries are very advanced in terms of applying, adapting to, uh, integrating uh, ITs and technologies at schools, at universities, at home, at businesses, in our daily life. And all indicators that are there just confirm that technologically these countries are uh, ahead of uh, everybody in the neighborhood. Politically, they are no longer those little you know, states that need foreign protection and are sitting there like ducklings afraid of foreigners, and etc. These states, politically, the Arab Gulf states are very visible, very active, very assertive. They go out free of, uh, they don't even consult with uh, superpowers to do this and that. So they are politically much more, you know, they have the muscles militarily to uh, engage in hot uh, wars and do their uh, own share of uh, facing up to challenges uh, they would not dare do or were capable of doing anything like that 40 years ago, 30 years ago. And uh, probably finally, regionally and globally, uh, you know, today these countries are very visible on the map. They were not as visible on the map as they are today. So globally, regionally, these countries are more and more are recognized as formidable, as influential, as, as credible, as trustworthy, I would, I would, you know, probably 30, 40 years ago, I would not dare say anything like this. So globally, regionally, they are very assertive, very visible, very, they are now more confident of their resources and of their capability, much more confident than they were a decade ago. And today also they have acquired this very important, distinct Khaliji identity. Not Gulf identity, I emphasize Khaliji identity because it conveys a whole lot of things when you say Khaliji identity and Khaliji brand and Khaliji state and Khaliji society and Khaliji economy, etc. Which is basically, when I say Khaliji, is associated with 33 years old GCC, Gulf Cooperation Council, like any other uh, you know, integration region, uh, regional integration, it has its own problems, it has its own you know, uh, setbacks between now and then, but it's a reality for sure, just like Europe, EU. They have problems too, Britain wants to you know, exit, etc. But, you know, but there is something, a reality called GCC, and hence a regional integration, and if there is one key concept to it all, it's a Khaliji thing that is going on in here. And we could go into, you know, defining it. I know of uh, PhDs are nowadays uh, uh, are written on Khaliji identities, etc. So, with these concepts, I like to go to the second point, which is the best embodiment of the Arab Gulf states of the 21st century probably is the United Arab Emirates, and that's why I think. You, whenever you think of the Arab Gulf states of the 21st century, you immediately bring something called the UAE moment. 
the UAE moment of the Gulf, the Arab Gulf of the 21st century, the new Gulf, the global Gulf, the post frontier Gulf. In the, in the lead, there is this, this country right here and in this place called the UAE momentum. And what do I do, what do I mean by the UAE momentum? The UAE is probably of the six Arab Gulf states, today is in best shape ever. It is in its best shape that I have seen this country in the past 44 years. I've never seen it so confident of itself. So you would not understand the Arab Gulf states of the 21st century without a reference without bringing this concept called the UAE momentum. The, the momentum is on the side of this country called the United Arab Emirates, but it is part of the whole. It wouldn't make a sense if you look at it in isolation. So there is a momentum in this Arab Gulf state of the 21st century, and this momentum is on the side of one country called the United Arab Emirates. And why the United Arab Emirates? Because it fits very well and what I said earlier about going to the future as opposed to making the future. Many think the future is out there and we're going to go to it. It doesn't make sense. That's not what the future. The future is what you make. It's not what, where you go to. And one country that is doing the most to make the next 10 years, the next 20 years, the, the, the first half of the 21st century, of all the other six states, it's the United Arab Emirates, because it, 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 it understands this concept of making the future as opposed to going to the future. And I believe that, you know, it's important if you want to understand the Arab Gulf states of the 21st century, that you really, you know, look into where we are right in here and see why is this country doing so much? And, and what does that you know, UAE momentum mean? Maybe it's good to bring history and compare. Maybe you should go a little bit to, you know, where the UAE was and where it has, where it is at the moment and where it intends to be in 2030 or 2000, even 50, because they're thinking of 2030 and they're planning for 2050. And they talk about it. And they have committees and they have working shop, uh, working groups that are really attending to all of this. Uh, you know, history could be very uh, important, but it could be also inspirational. And uh, I think you would no, not fully understand the UAE momentum and the UAE of the 21st century without comparing where it was in 1971. Just 44 years ago. Actually, in 1971, there was no UAE to start with. There were seven different sheikhdoms, seven different you know, emirates, each more or less in its own, not even independent. I would never have thought I would call myself an Emirati in 1970. So there wasn't an Emirati identity to start with. There wasn't a country to start with. And uh, indeed, uh, no one would have identified the UAE on the map, not even Dubai, which is competing now with Tokyo and Hong Kong and Paris, etc., on in terms of global visibility. Uh, you know, in 2000 and uh, 19, in, in, in 1971, the UAE was uh, a country that was well behind everybody else around it. Bahrain was ahead of us. Kuwait was certainly ahead of us. We were looking up to Kuwait in 1971. <laughs> Many of us were dreaming that we will become another Kuwait. In 1968, Sheikh Rashid of Dubai, 1968, I think, yes. He visited the city of Basra, Iraq, 1968. And you know what he, his dream was? 
1968, he thought, at that time, Basra used to be called the Venice of the East, by the way. And he thought that Dubai wants to be another, he wanted to make Dubai another Basra of that time. He thought that Dubai can be a second Basra. Basra was the role model, the port of the, of the time. Everybody used to go to Basra. And now look at where Dubai is and where Basra has ended up. And today, probably many people in Basra will probably say, wow, we want to be another Dubai. Now, fast forward, 40 years later, 1971, now we are 2016. Just imagine what has happened in this very short, not really short, but 44 years to understand the momentum of it, to understand where we were and where we have, we are at and where we are uh, going into. Today, the, the 200 million dollar economy of 1970 is today a 400 billion dollar. It was 200 million dollar GDP in 1970. The 260,000 UAE people of the UAE have become 9.5 million people. The UAE had a per capita income of 1,000 dollar in 1971. Today it has a per capita income of over $60,000. It was among the bottom 10. Today it's among the top five. We left everybody else behind us. Kuwait today would love to be another Dubai. Bahrain's dream is to be another UAE. We have gone beyond Lebanon, and Egypt, and everybody else. So this is just to bring to your attention how far the UAE has gone in span of 44 years to understand the momentum and to understand why I say the UAE of today, the UAE of 2016, in the best shape ever. I have never seen the UAE as confident as it is today. And I have never seen the UAE as relaxed, probably, as it is today. And on top of it, it is the one country that is not settling down. It wants to go places. This is not enough. And this is where you know, you come to the UAE and understand the momentum of it, and you just saw last week what we, uh, you know, saw a revamping of the entire government, brand new government, catering to the 21st century. We have also going to be the first to introduce important measures to further uh, diversify the resources of this country. The VAT is coming, whether we like it or not. The country has empowered its women. Unbelievable. The women of the UAE are living their golden age. Better than the women, the rest of the, the women in the region. And thinking of 2020, the expo is coming. You think of 2030, they think that by that time we will, you know, the oil is going to be just not of any significance to our economy probably. And they're going to Mars, for, believe it or not. And you better believe it, you know. This guy, when they say something, they mean it. So when I say, if you want to understand the Arab Gulf states of the 21st century, the one category that you have to bring it to your attention is the momentum that is going on in this country that is leading the other six Arab Gulf states. But the Arab Gulf states or the, the UAE momentum would not make a sense or doesn't fit in and doesn't make sense if you don't bring the 
third category, which is the Gulf moment. The, the UAE momentum is only a part of what I call of a bigger event taking place in this part of the world, which is called the Gulf moment in contemporary Arab history. And what do I mean by the Gulf moment? The Gulf moment, very briefly, and I uh, don't want to spend too much time on this uh, topic, the Gulf moment means that over the last 20 years, something very unique, something very interesting has happened in this part of the world. And that unique thing is that for the first time in Arab history, the part has become more influential than the whole. The part nowadays have more influence over the whole, that is the Arab world, than the whole over the part. We have never seen anything like this in the Arab history, by the way. The part meaning the six Arab Gulf states have today more influence over the other 16 Arab countries, including Egypt, including Algeria, including Syria, including all of them, which are in shambles, more or less. They have more influence on the other 16 Arab states than the 16 Arab states on the six Arab Gulf states. That's the Gulf moment in Arab history. The part have more influence over the whole than the whole over the part. And this thing has been going on for a while. It's not just a creation of the last four to five years. This has been going on for a while, but we have not recognized it. It's not just due to the fact that Egypt and Syria and Iraq are in whatever shape they are today, but they, this thing has been going on. And it is all-encompassing, and it's not just economics or oil of it. It is all-encompassing. It, it, it is so broad. It encompasses everything. Our cities are the role models. Our companies are in the lead. Our, our businessmen, our women, our universities, our media... Khaliji songs, Khaliji whatever, they are today are the ones that are making the buzz. They are the ones that are in the lead. They are the ones, the trendsetter. They are the role model. Yeah, this is where, what the Gulf moment is all about. So, the Arab Gulf states of the 21st centuries, when you break it down, deconstruct it, you look at the UAE momentum, you look at the Gulf moment, and you look at the vast changes, uh, categories like the new Gulf, as I said, categories like a post frontier states, global Gulf, they all add up to this huge thing that's the title of this uh, uh, talk today, uh, which is the Arab Gulf states of the 21st uh, uh, century. Now, it's not uh, by any mean free of problems. It's not all rosy and glamorous and uh, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's problem free, etc. No, absolutely not. We have a lot of problems to think about, a lot of challenges to address. And let me just touch on very briefly on two, and I will uh, end uh, after that. And the first challenge, which is huge, it is true that these Arab Gulf states, the six of them, are leading and living their moment, but they don't live in a vacuum. And the principle, the central challenge is the security. There's absolutely no way you feel secure while you are at the same time living in the literally the most dangerous region on earth today. Absolutely doesn't make sense. This is the neighborhood that we belong. 
is a red zone. It's a jungle out there. It is, by some account, the most violent. Eight active armed conflict taking place at this very moment. Every single year, more than 1,000 people get killed. The most dangerous terrorist organization on earth are just next door. We live next to a very difficult neighbor up north. And we have a hot war down in the south. And it's, it's not easy. So the central challenge, how do you maintain your safety, your security, your stability, your prosperity, your momentum, and your moment, while at the same time you have to think that you are part of the one of the most dangerous region on earth. Do you think that's an easy challenge? Think twice. How do you deal with it is another issue. Do you need to just shield yourself? Of course you can. Do you go proactive? There's a price for that. So it's very difficult for the guys sitting in Abu Dhabi and Riyadh and uh, Kuwait and Manama and the other capital. But that's the first channel. Let me also alert you to the second challenge, which is the challenge of the future. It's not going to be easy as we go on. We are ahead of everybody in almost every indicators, vital indicators you think of, but the demands, the challenges, the difficulties of the years ahead is surmounted. It's, it's formidable. It's very difficult. It's not easy. It needs a lot of investment to go beyond the physical infrastructure that you have already, which is the state of the art, to go to a next huge category, which is the intangible, the not so physical, the infrastructure, the infrastructure that is, that is value-oriented. It has to do with culture and with education, with human well-being, etc. And what the UAE is doing is exactly that. It's trying to fit in those loaded values that are needed for the 21st century. And it needs a lot of investment to build the post-oil, post-rentier society and economy. UAE has already invested 81 billion dollar to build the non oil economy. That's a lot of money. And you know it comes at a time when there is a low oil price. It doesn't come at a time when it is one hundred dollar per barrel. That was a party time. When it is sixty dollar, it's a difficult time. When it is thirty dollars, Come up with your own word how to describe it. It's very, very difficult. But again, you are focusing on the future and you have to invest. How do you do this? That's a major challenge for this country and for the Arab Gulf states. So, is this thing sustainable for the 10 years? Yes. For 20 years, I bet my money. And I have enough money in my pocket here. 30 years down the road, Maybe yes, too. So I think I say with total confidence, despite all the challenges in the region and despite all the challenges related to building for the future, I think the first half of the 21st century is UAE century. Still, it's going to be the Arab Gulf state. So up to 2050, I am pretty sure we are, we are going to be good. After that, I'm not going to be around, so I don't know. Okay? <laughs> so just uh, maybe it's up to you. But I, I, I leave it for somebody else to dwell on, you know, 2050. It's the first part that I'm sure, I'm confident that will stay as the Gulf momentum the Gulf uh, moment and the United Arab Emirates momentum. There are, you know, the list of challenges endless. I could come up with 
you know, five other until ten challenges, but I leave it maybe to the question and common sense there, and thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Hello, Professor. Thanks so much for the talk today. My name is Kim. I'm from the Australian Embassy. I was particularly interested in the changes you talked about post-2000. And for us, of course, at probably any embassy, we look at these changes quite carefully. And one of them, the assertiveness and the confidence that you talked about, particularly in a foreign policy sense, is something most of us are analyzing and, and trying to figure out. And one of the things I'd be keen to hear a little bit more from you on is why do you think the UAE and potentially other GCC states, but the UAE in particular, made the judgment call that it was worth taking that step? It was worth being more assertive. It was worth being more on the front foot because there's obviously risks that do go along with that. So any comment you might be able to offer there would be really useful. Thank you. Shall we address each question individually? Maybe we should do that. Yeah, is that okay, Philip? Yeah? No, I like to, maybe that's a, that's a very challenging question. And why the UAE is so assertive? these days more than they were than it was uh, just a decade ago. Uh, I think, uh, let me start with this. Uh, it's uh, the dangerous zone, the difficult neighborhood that we were part of has become 10 times more difficult. And uh, there is absolutely no way on earth that you could live in a, a bubble. You were bound to be affected by what's going on. And it was getting inching in closer and closer every single day. Well, we thought that it was out there somewhere in Palestine or God knows where, but now it's becoming very close to our border. So you have two alternatives. As a decision maker in Abu Dhabi, you either sit down, bunker, shield yourself, and say, hell with it all, I am not going to bother. There is a price for that, because eventually you might be targeted. And the other alternative, well, there is a cost to doing nothing. But the other alternative is, no, I'm not going to sit in here anymore. I'm confident of myself. And there's a duty to go out after these bad guys and after all these, uh, you know, to go to the source. And there is a cost to that too. It's not free of cost, by the way. And I imagine the leaders of this country have thought of these two alternatives, doing nothing or doing something. And they figured out, as rational actors do, the cost of doing nothing versus the cost of doing something. And they found out that the cost of doing nothing is going to be just not acceptable. And more than anything else that they had in mind is what Iran is doing today. Iran is just going out of its way. And it's all over the place. And I think there is a limit to what you can take. And finally, the momentum came, or the moment came, in Yemen, right in there, and they said, enough is enough. We're going to do our own job, even if America does not agree to this. So that's one case of assertiveness. But that's not the only case. We have also gone after Daesh to fulfill our, our uh, international uh, obligations, because this is... Uh, you know, uh, an organization that is uh, a threat to you, to us, to everybody else. So, you know, you, you have to do something about it. And the OAE has been all over the place. It is a sign of confidence. It's a sign that, yes, we are, as much as we are confident, we are also concerned about what's going on in the region 
And if nobody is going to take action, we might as well do it. So I think that's where the assertiveness is coming from. Hi, my name is Nina. And obviously, I've been here for 10 years um, in, the, in, the, in the UAE. I first I lived in Dubai for six years. I've been here now in Abu Dhabi for four years. When I lived in Dubai and I came to Abu Dhabi on business, I go, ooh, you live in Dubai. Then I came to Abu Dhabi. Now I go to Dubai and go, ooh, you live in Abu Dhabi. Um, at which point you feel that the UAE will actually really grow together as one nation rather than seven separate nations. Because I've had, I know people here in Abu Dhabi who are much closer to the Saudi brothers and Kuwaiti brothers than they're to the brothers and sisters in Umar Queen. Uh, could you just repeat the second one, maybe? I, see, I know people in Abu Dhabi who yes. are much closer yeah, to yeah. the brothers across the GCC than to the brothers and sisters in Umar Queen in the same UAE. So when I talk to people on a daily basis, it doesn't seem to be really that united. Oh, OK. No, nobody pretended or said that we are totally, completely a one country. Still, the GCC is still a sixth GCC. And as much as there is similarity, there is vast differences between them. And look at Europe, too. You know, there is also Europe, which is uh, trying to unite. But at the same time, there is uh, different countries. So how far are we in that regional integration? Maybe we are still you know, on the five, maybe four out of 10 or something, okay? So don't, you know, nobody has pretended yet that the regional integration, the Gulf regional integration is in its best. We still have a long way to do. We have found out from first, first, first encounter experience with integration, that integration is not easy. Integration is not just done, you know, by signing documents, etc. It takes a lot of work to really get an integration going. It takes much more work to keep it uh, to keep it working and to realize its goals. Okay, so integrations, GCC, whatever, throughout history, they are very difficult. Most fall apart. Very few stay together. And those who stay together, the rule is one step forward, half a step backward. <sighs> Throughout history, all over the place. So the Kuwaitis will always remain Kuwaiti, and UAE will always remain UAE. And, but I think if you want to look at the tra trajectory of it, 33 years of GCC, I think the, the curve has been going upward. And there's a lot of meticulous, a lot of details that goes into it, by the way. And if I am to project the future, say 2021, I think the GCC is going to be much more integrated than it is right now. So I think, you know, I am, I am a bit uh, optimistic about it. It's not, uh, you know, it's not going to happen uh, over the night and it's, long, uh, uh, it's a long process. But we have the GCC, after 30 years, we have gone beyond the point of breaking up. That threshold of the integration, of breaking, make, to be or not to be, I think we passed the, the to be or not to be. We are going to stay in there. And I don't think even the most reluctant of us uh, wants to leave uh, this, this, this integration, but it's, it's good for everybody. Um, you, you grabbed my attention when you mentioned uh, Kuwait and Basra. And uh, in the 60s and 50s, a lot of uh, maybe the, the generation of 50s and 60s used to go to Kuwait to work. And you know that. Um, I think the question now is not to, uh, to know the causes of development, but how to sustain it. Um, this is the first question. And second question, I think, the, uh, do you think the assertiveness of the Gulf states is because uh, the collapse of regional order of the Middle East, and uh, what's the end game for the Gulf countries um, in terms of uh, uh, the problems in the, in the region? I think this is uh, Thank you. Uh, I, you know, I think I, I, I touched on the sustainability. This is a question that I've been hearing since day one. 
every time they tell me, is Dubai sustainable, is UAE middle sustainable, is the GCC sustainable? Uh, you know, five years later, it's been going on. It's Ten years later, it uh, keeps going, et cetera, et cetera. So, I, you know, I think for, 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 the, for the, best, uh, the best answer to this is I don't have a doubt, a shred of a doubt, that the GCC is going to be there ten years down the road or uh, whatever. Okay, so I think there is a, the dynamic is there, uh, the, the, the trickling down impact of it is there, okay? And I think uh, 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 the Gulf uh, uh, Corporation eventually will go into Gulf Union and maybe one day it will be also a, a united Gulf. So I, I have no doubt about, uh, about this. The assertiveness has to do with the collapse of the Arab regional system. Of course it does, you know. I, after all, if you are living the Gulf moment, if that moment is really true, then there is responsibility that comes with it. After all, no matter what you do, what you say, you are part of an Arab civilization, an Arab history, an Arab culture, an Arab, you are an Arab. This is where Arabness started with. So there is, there is a lot of responsibility that Saudi Arabia, UAE, Kuwait, etc., are carrying at this moment. You know, when there is no Egypt or Iraq or Syria, you know, do, do you leave this for others to, you know, to, to, to be in the driver's seat? There is no other uh, group of states or a state that needs at this moment to shoulder the responsibility to, to, towards the Arab causes in general than the six Arab Gulf states. And that's why, you know, you have to, you know, just live up to the moment of it. And the moment, if it's not, uh, you know, you have stability and prosperity, etc. But there is a responsibility that goes with it, and I think part of this responsibility is to heed calls when the government of Yemen asks you, "Please come and help me," because you know, otherwise I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gone. You just have to take that responsibility. If if Egypt was in a better shape than it is today, they would probably do the job. But today, is, there is no Egypt, and. Uh, there is UAE and Saudi Arabia, more or less. The others are there, but I think it's UAE, Saudi Arabia that is driving that Gulf assertiveness. So it is a huge historical responsibility befallen on us, and if we don't live up, up to it, I think we are failing our Arabs and failing ourselves and failing history. So we have to just live up to that responsibility. That's where the assertiveness, assertiveness comes from. Yes. Assalamu alaikum and uh, thank you, Dr. Abdul Khaliq, for a very interesting lecture. Thank you. Uh, you touched upon one of the threat that, or the risk that the UAE momentum, the GCC, uh, you know, um, uh, moment, as you said, is security. And the way I took it is more regional uh, risk rather than, you know, other risk that could come from, you know, a changing world which we live in. Now, if you add into that picture the fact that you know, the geopolitics of the world is changing right now where we live in a, in a world where, you know, there is powers coming from Asia that is rising, the like of China, geopolitically, economically, and uh, militarily. And also the, the comeback of Russia, if I may say that, as, as sort of regional um, or maybe super, uh, super power. And also the diminishing role of, of, the, uh, of the U.S. In, in the region. And add to that the, to, the, to, uh, the fact that in... In the region, we, there is a lack of balance between powers. You, know, you have Iran on one side. We used to have Iraq now. The balance is, is not there anymore. If you were in, in a position to give an advice to a decision maker in the GCC, what would be, what would be your advice given you know, this you know, complexity that we, we live in? And thank you very much. I, do, I don't give free advices, so it uh, <laughs> depends how much they pay me for, it, uh, for the advice. No, it's not... Uh, you know, you know, there is a, the changes is taking all over the place. Okay, there is a, a tremendous changes all over the place. Asia is rising. America is probably retreating a little bit. Europe is also having problem. Russia has plans of itself, and we are in the midst of it. Okay, but two things. First, for the past forty years, we have literally one hundred percent were depending on the American protection. We have now hearing messages from America that says, look, 
this 100% addiction and dependence on our protection probably is not going to last for too long. It might drop 5%, 10%, etc. It's not going to go away uh, uh, tomorrow. But I think the idea is sinking in that America is going to be around, but not as totally committed as they were 40, 50 years ago for various reasons. Has to do with America, has to do with oil, has to do with shifting priorities. Okay, so I am short 5%, 10% security deficiency. Where do I get that from? I try to toughen my own uh, defenses, I try to uh, you know, integrate myself, but there are also other willing partners. NATO may be there, China is there, etc., Asia. So, you know, you have to think of the future, and I think that's a very legitimate question, and I think we are at a time where we have to think that America is not going to be here for, for, for a long, just as Britain stayed here for 150 years and then it decided to leave. But America is not going to leave in tomorrow or 10 years down the road or 50 years down the road. Uh, but eventually, maybe they will. So there is this 5%, 6%. Um, uh, deficiency in the security uh, that uh, you have to make up for. Uh, China, the rise of China. Actually, the rise of China is very important, the second biggest economy, although they have a problem. But there is something, very, uh, an interesting dynamic that is evolving, a historical moment of a sort, which is called the rise of Asia. The rise of Asia, the center of gravity is moving from the Atlantic to the Pacific, from Europe and America to Asia, namely, you know, the second biggest economy and the third biggest economy and fourth and fifth are nowadays in, 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 in Asia. And for the first time in, in years, I think the Gulf have, are the Gulf states and Gulf people are becoming aware of their Asian affinity. Asian identity. We are West Asia just as much as we are part of the Arab world. I think that's something sinking in. That's why you see Sheikh Mohammed going to India, going to China, and eventually is going to Australia, pretty soon, etc. Because I think we are also living this moment that, wait a second, there is something new is happening in the horizon called Asia. And Asianness, our we are part of that Asianness, Asian community maybe at, uh, in, in the long. So I think Asia is becoming bigger and bigger in our life, security-wise, political-wise, commercial-wise, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But it's not that Asia is becoming important in our consciousness, but Asians, Korea, Japan, etc., are also becoming more and more aware of the Gulf and the potential that exists here, not just for the oil of it, but for launching part to Africa and to the region, etc. So there is this moment, Gulf moment, Asian moment, they're coming at the same time in history. I see that kind of dynamic evolving at the end of the day. Russia, it's the bad guy. I don't want to talk about it. <laughs> Thank you for a very good lecture. My question to you is about the Gulf moment. Do you think this Gulf moment will translate to peace with the state of Israel, and do you think that uh, we would expect to see the reignition of the peace initiative uh, 2002 that was led by Saudi Arabia? Thank you. Short answer, no, definitely not. I do want to, however, give you a full stop. Uh, Israel will forever remain as the enemy of the, of the Arab world, okay? I can get over this feeling-wise, emotion-wise, etc. as long as Israel is occupying Palestinian land, doing what it is doing on the daily basis, absolutely no way that the Arab Gulf state will have any sort of collaboration with Israel. I will be the first to say no, I'll be against any kind of normalization, if, even if my government decides to do that. Let me say it frankly here, okay? I will be against any kind of normalization as long as Israel is occupying Palestine. So, Palestinians have the right like any other nation on earth to have a state of their own. This group of country, the six million, had now 70 years of injustices 
and the world is doing absolutely nothing about it because of this arrogant state of Israel, because of its total hold in American politics, Australian politics, sorry, uh, or European politics, etc. And they just, you know, uh, 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 they see injustices and they are doing absolutely nothing about it. And I think uh, at the end of the day, uh, peace will only come if we have a Palestine with Jerusalem as its capital. Otherwise, there will not be peace. And at the core of all the tension in this region is this longest regional conflict that has been going on for the past 30 years. All other regional conflict in the world has subsided except this one. And as long as this continues, we will see all sorts of problems and tensions and violences and terrorism and etc. in this region.